I've just um, finished a book on this topic that will be out with Polity later this year. And if there's a main thesis of the book, it is that <coughs> whiteness is not a concept <laughs> or that it's not simply a concept or reducible to a political concept. But here, I'm, I'm interested and happy to have the opportunity to think whiteness as a concept as a concept of social identity, that's how I'm going to approach it, which is usually tied to the modern period, though Nell Painter and other historians perceive a preference for light skin in the ancient world. As a racial concept, whiteness obviously requires the existence of the concept of race, not simply peoples, ethnic groups, or what Elaine Locke referred to as lumps. <laughs> and in the ancient world, peoples were generally distinguished environmentally. You had the people from the mountains and the people from the valleys and so forth. I am among those who believe that the beginnings of our more familiar concept of race came not from the head of Kant, but actually three centuries or so earlier with the emergence of the concept of sangre de puro, that became part of the alibi for Spain's, the alibi and the motive for Spain's inquisition. And this was the idea of purity of blood, that a person born a Jew or a Moor will remain dispositionally so, no matter their new volitional commitments or altered practices. So I don't think, against Appia, that the concept of race requires um, advanced biology. I think we get the notion of, of inherent immutable dispositions that are grouped um, in some way earlier. The concept of whiteness itself has no long legacy of authoritative definitions as do so many of the other terms that we've learned about in the last two days. One has to endeavor to discern its emergence, its meanings, and it's shifting boundaries, and one of the best places to do that, of course, is with legal judgments, primarily as those, um, for example, uh, legal judgments setting out who was allowed to serve on juries. And the history of legal judgments is a, is a really rich resource to see the emergence of meanings of, of whiteness, particularly in, um, in the United States, and it's a rich resource of comedy, I think, so that maybe ties our two papers together. But this means that whiteness is contextual and local and fluid, and that is going to be my approach to the meaning of whiteness here. To discern whiteness, then, one has to read between the lines, as Toni Morrison suggests in Playing in the Dark. It is whiteness that plays and dominates in the dark. I want to begin with a literary passage from 1932 where one does not need to read between the lines. Quote, he could now see his life opening before him, uncomplex and inescapable as a barren corridor, completely freed now of ever again having to think or decide. The burden which he now assumed and carried as bright and weightless and martial as his insignatory brass, a sublime and implicit faith in physical courage and blind obedience and a belief that the white race is superior to any and all other races and that the American is superior to all other white races and that the American uniform is superior to all men and that all that would ever be required of him in payment for this belief, this privilege, would be his own life. So in that passage from Light in August, Faulkner deftly moves from American exceptionalism, which is an idea about the uniqueness of the polity of the United States, to what I want to call white exceptionalism, which is an idea about the vanguard status of the white race. Now these may appear to be distinct concepts, and it's true that some ostensible anti-racists will make positive reference to American exceptionalism while disavowing white supremacy. 
President Obama, for example, has reportedly used the phrase American exceptionalism more than any other president. But I want to suggest that there's a strong historical link between the concepts, so much so that their meaning is intertwined. American exceptionalism is the idea that the United States is a unique historical configuration in which class mobility and ethnic integration has triumphed over the antagonisms and status hierarchies of old Europe. This idea has been invoked in public political discourse in the US since the 1920s, but it traces further back to the perceptions of de Tocqueville and saint Crevecoeur, among others. The primary use of the concept of American exceptionalism today, as we know, is not so much self-congratulation as to legitimate global militarism and economic imperialism. Its reference to the US as a polyglot nation serves to conceal its close association with whiteness, white supremacy. Hector Saint-Jean de Crevecoeur's influential epistolary essay, Letters from an American Farmer, that he published in 1782, effectively interpolates the new republic as having formed a new people, or as having formed a people anew, by leaving their old identities and ways of being behind them. Notably, this new people did not include the disenfranchised native peoples or African slaves who were cohabiting the space because the Republic was created out of the experience of European immigrants <coughs> fleeing oppression and poverty and thus motivated to shed their old cultures and form a new political identity within the protection of this new revolutionary state. Grevacher says, quote, we are nothing but what we derive from the air we breathe, the climate we inhabit, the government we obey, the system of religion we profess, and the nature of our employment." Unquote. Old ties fall away as this new identity takes shape through a combination of new volitional commitments in a new and fresh, untapped, quote unquote, <laughs> environment. This process of identity formation did not apply to the non-citizens who lack a volitional relation to the government or motivation. They also lack a motivation to shed their old skins. It is likely for this reason that Thomas Jefferson believed African slaves must go to live elsewhere after they were to be emancipated. And he believed that their emancipation was inevitable. But they were never included in the polity. They were separated by color, he said, and they were unfit in his view by reason of their inferiority. So he says, quote, the two races equally free cannot live in the same government, unquote. And a further reason he gives is that their just grievances, that's his word, that's his phrase, their just grievances after slavery's abolition, quote, will lead to convulsions which will probably never end but in the extermination of one or the other race." Unquote. Notice that the arguments of Crevecoeur and Jefferson about why the polity of the United States is essentially European are historically concrete, as well as sociological and psychological. This may get me into trouble, but I, I like those arguments. They're not Schmidtian or Derridian arguments. I think because they're historical arguments, they're sociological and psychological arguments, we can answer them in a way that we can't answer uh, other forms of the argument. To be American, then, is to emerge from volitional immigration, happy to be born anew. It is to have a faculty of mind sufficient to participate equally with one's compatriots. And it is to be not riven with grievances. Legitimate or not makes no differences to the role the grievances will play in sundering the coherence of the republic. Thus, to be fit for the democratic experiment of this continent is to hail exclusively from Europe. Neither native peoples nor former slaves have the same motivations as the Europeans. Now we know how long a period of adjustment it has taken for this to be truly applied to all Europeans, from the south of Europe as well as the north. But nonetheless, the sort of view Crevecoeur and Jefferson held 
still holds sway over national attitudes toward native peoples, peoples of the African diaspora, and immigrants from elsewhere they are, that are w unwilling to assimilate, too different to assimilate, too inferior, it's believed, and as such, cannot be part of the exceptional polity that justifiably leads the world. So I'm suggesting that exceptionalism is built into the concept of whiteness, that that's sort of the key concept of, of whiteness in this locale. To be white is not to be a, one among others, sharing a polity or a government or a planet, one alongside others. It's to be the vanguard, separate from others whose relations with others will be as leaders. This poses a problem for the coming demographic changes in the United States after 2042, when whites will no longer constitute the majority. It poses a problem for the ability of whites to adapt to a multipolar country. And I know there are other examples around the world in which whites are a minority but have maintained their economic and uh, political leadership in some cases, but um, I, I think we need to remain local with our analysis and see what's going to happen here. White exceptionalism is then, I think, the more accurate name for the idea of American exceptionalism, though it needs the nationalist specificity Faulkner supplies when he says that, quote, the American is superior to all other white races and that the American uniform is superior to all men. There is also undoubtedly, a, you know, you could formulate a non-nationalist, more inclusive version of white exceptionalism in which whites of any nation are thought to constitute a race that leads the world technologically, scientifically, entrepreneurially, politically, morally, and artistically. Du Bois, in his shrewd irony, casts a white racist voice in his own, Du Bois' own autobiography, making this point just so. Quote, look around and see the pageantry of the world. It belongs to white men. It's the expression of white power. It's the product of white brains. Who can have the effrontery to stand for a moment and compare with white triumph Yellow and brown anarchy and black savagery? That's from Dusk of Dawn. Note that Faulkner says this belief will cost one his life. The protagonist of Light in August who's having these thoughts is actually a mixed race man who's been lately passing for white. Hence, we might read Faulkner as saying that it is non-white's loyalty to white supremacy that will end badly. But Jefferson's ominous prediction for a post-emancipation race war suggests there is a more general price to be paid for the belief, even the past belief, that the white race is so superior to all others that they can be annihilated and enslaved. The openness of the future seems to be foreclosed by such ideas. So I want to now connect this um, to a kind of left-wing version of white exceptionalism which I see today. So to see this, we need to look at another site in which we can read between the lines. The virtual, and it occurs in a virtual debate that occurred between the English physicist Sir Isaac Newton and the German poet Goethe on the topic of the unique character of white light. These interlocutors, of course, lived a century apart, but their differences continue to spark debates among theorists of the science of color and light. The question that Newton and Goethe were each concerned to address was the following. Where does white light fit within the spectrum of colored light? Where, in other words, does whiteness fit among the other colors? Sir Newton held that whiteness has a unique character that renders it absolutely distinct. It is the only color, he argued, that includes all the other colors. Through the process of diffraction, a prism refracting white light will produce the entire color spectrum, creating a rainbow effect. Since only white light has this capacity, it is unique. 
Goethe vigorously pursued interest in philosophy, theology, and the empirical sciences along with his poetry, and he took a particular interest in light and color. Writing about a century after Newton, Goethe took issue with Newton's account, observing that color arises in the spectrum, not from white light itself, but at the border between light and dark. Hence, color is not subsumed within whiteness, as Newton thought, but emerges just at its immediate perimeter. We should understand white light as essentially indivisible and absolutely homogeneous, a pure entity fundamentally separate from color. Despite their differences, Goethe and Newton both gave white light a privileged place and their theories eerily mimic some of the most powerful ideologies of racial whiteness still prevalent today that render it a thing apart. Goethe conceives white light as a form of indivisible purity as if a single drop of color <laughs> would taint and alter its identity. And he makes this characteristic unique to whiteness. No other color is so easily besmirched by contamination. While other colors move along a continuum of shades with gradations of intensity, only slowly changing their identity, white light on his theory is unique in needing to stand alone, unable to merge or survive even one drop of dilution. Against this portrayal, Newton conceived of white light as a kind of universal representation, capable of standing in for the complete color spectrum. Just as some have viewed whiteness as representing the unadulterated essence of humanity or the true universal of the human form, so Newton viewed white light as the one universally inclusive form of light. The entire color spectrum can be represented by whiteness, he thought, while non-white colors can only represent, in a sense, their own. One might wonder at the unconscious racialist impulses that guided this famous debate, especially when we read Goethe saying in his 1774 letter to, letter to Jacobi that lightness, quote, is the simplest, most undivided, most homogeneous being that we know. Confronting it is the darkness, unquote. Goethe and Newton were both writing, after all, during the period of European colonial expansion, at a time when the types and categories of human groups were being allocated a moral and social status based on color. Whether or not either of these great theorists were exhibiting their racial unconscious, both positions exemplify by analogy at least alternate forms of what I am calling white exceptionalism. So, in conclusion, White exceptionalism is, I want to suggest, manifest in both racist and anti-racist discourses today. There's a racist version of white exceptionalism and an anti-racist one. In racist form, whiteness is presented as the vanguard of the human race, while in the anti-racist form, whiteness is presented as incapable of being accommodated within the rainbow. Because racism constitutes white identity, and there's a now, there is now a wealth of empirical work in economics and social psychology and history, among other fields, charting the difference that whiteness makes. We can locate its history. We can observe its state support and state orchestration. Uh, the claim that whiteness is essentially tied to racism has a lot of evidence in its favor. And so that has led to this sort of anti-racist version of white exceptionalism that whiteness cannot outlast 2042. It cannot become one among the other colors. It cannot um, transform itself to take a place in line among others. And therefore, uh, some theorists argue, whiteness has to disappear. To be an anti-racist white is to be a a contradiction. In truth, however exceptional the history of ideational concepts of whiteness have been, and they have been exceptional, but in truth I want to suggest whiteness as a social identity has emerged organically out of a set of particular historical experiences, specific opportunities, and cultural practices just as other group identities <coughs> have been formed as its social context changes 
the racial formation we call whiteness will be necessarily altered. It's not exceptional in this sense, nor is it simply a concept. Rather, whiteness is a descriptive term with a referent whose future is uncertain. Thank you. Emily asked that I tell at least one joke in this. <laughs> uh, it's not funny. <laughs> 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 that was a joke that was uh, provided by Lydia. So thanks for that. <laughs> so in line with uh, Kozelik's uh, idea uh, behind this uh, lexicon, the uh, Begriffsgeschichte, uh, I intend to provide at least a uh, working definition of comedy and say something about its political meaning. Now, as far as its uh, definition goes, we are not doing very well. I'll begin with a quote from Keller Simon in his book, from his book, The Labyrinth of the Comic, uh, Comic who says, virtually everything that could be said about the subject of comedy has been said. Every position, its counterposition, and their synthesis. Critics have argued that comedy is a force of civilization and the force of nature against the repressions of civilization. Uh, and the comic corrects, that comic corrects uh, aberrant behavior, and then the comic does not correct aberrant behavior. That comedy celebrates what is, and that it celebrates what should be. That it represents detachment from life, and that represents engagement with life. That it is an irrational attitude, a rational attitude, and the force both irrational and rational, that it is poli politically left and politically right. That it affirms freedom and that it denies freedom. That it shows the victory of the individual and that it shows the victory of society over individual. That its subject is carnival and that its subject is everyday life. That it requires self-consciousness and that it requires a lack of self-consciousness." Unquote. So as you see, there is a, a whole plurality of uh, meanings and interpretations of comedy. Uh, and some people say even that it is, uh, its essence is ungraspable, as uh, Agnes Kelly does. Against such a readings of comedy, and this is, will be my thesis here, I want to argue that comedy is uh, a political, philosophical, rational enterprise that speaks to the very definition of human being as a zone politicon who has logos. This is very famous Aristotle's definition of human being as political animal who is endowed with uh, uh, logos reason of speech, and lives in a constant uh, renewal, uh, constantly renewed political co communication or koinonia with others. Comedy uh, then both in its uh, whole makeup and its major uh, characters is judgmental and therefore rational because comedy is a dramatic locus for the realization of freedom and the freedom to act presupposes the freedom to think and judge. So paraphrasing Hegel, here, his famous claim that the actual is the rational and the rational is the actual, uh, one might say that the comic is the rational and the rational is the comic. So in my understanding, uh, therefore, comedy is a rational enterprise meant to promote human well-being that also comes with an account of ways of its achieving. Comedy, then, is a well-ordered action that involves interaction of a number of actors, not just one isolated subject, and moves through inevitable complication to a resolution and good ending that restores justice and equality among the actors. So now with of, of history. Throughout its history, philosophy has tended to ignore the comedy and in fact, in fact uh, misunderstood it as I see it from, its, uh, uh, from the very beginning. A reason for this may be that comedy is considered secondary to and derivative from tragedy. For instance, in his poetics, Aristotle lists comedy, comedia, together with tragedy, epic, and dithyramp, as a way of imitation, it's mimesis. And yet, unlike tragedy, which is an imitation of the best, of the best in people, the best people, comedy imitates the worst. Even, uh, even more so, comedy presents the funny and ridiculous to Geloian, which belongs to the genus of the ugly or shameful, to Eichron, as such, the funny by itself is uh, just a mistake, which, however, is still pardonable because it does not cause pain or inflict any harm. Uh, 
Now, Plato takes uh, comedy already quite seriously, perhaps too seriously, because comedy is imitative and appeals to the passions rather than reason. Uh, it spoils public morals, and therefore, in the Republic, Plato suggests that comedy is dangerous to a serious and right political constitution, and therefore has no place in it. Because comedy is an imitation of the worst, lowest, and the basest in humans, it surely cannot be but vulgar, both in its origin, which is popular, vulgus, uh, or people, and hence I think it's really democratic, uh, uh, in, 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 uh, originates in demos, and also in its, uh, in its elements, for instance, that it comes from Felix songs. No wonder then that for a long time comedy existed and developed in total obscurity, hidden from a watchful philosophical eye, so that uh, already Aristotle could not establish the names of those who made significant innovations to comedy. Now, there are many uh, excellent philosophical works uh, on tragedy in modern philosophy, beginning with Hegel, including some of my friends and colleagues who are present uh, here. Uh, and yet, uh, there are very few significant philosophical works on comedy. Yeah? It is uh, worth noting that in, it is uh, literally in the last 10 years that some really outstanding and significant philosophical works have been published. I can uh, mention only those by Agnes Heller, Veronique Sternberg, Alenka Zupancic, and Anna Geri. It also was worth noting that uh, all of them have been written by women. I have no explanation of this phenomenon, but just want to note it. <laughs> Philosophers are always more fascinated with tragedy, or seem to be fascinated with tragedy, than with comedy. Now, why? I take it that this happens because tragedy corresponds to the construction of modern subject. Yeah? In its autonomy, solitude <coughs> and loneliness, and thus inevitable suffering, which the subject itself takes as a sign of its a kind of nobility and sublimity. Such a, such a subject always faces its finitude, its being toward death, sein zum Tode. Modern subjectivity constructs itself as the center of meanings, as the omphalos of the spiritual world. Modern subject, in a sense, practices suffering, when it is being torn between its freedom and fate, in Sophocles, uh, Oedipus the King, or between different normative value systems, yeah. in the Antigone, for example. Modern subject is very serious about itself and everything it uh, produces. Therefore, it is very serious, that serious, about philosophy, about politics as well, which it takes as the highest expression of its freedom and autonomy of thinking. So here I want to uh, quote Rancière from his uh, paper, 10 Thesis on Politics, which is probably about the only thing uh, uh, where I agree uh, with Rancière, at least in what I read. The first thesis runs, I quote, politics is not the exercise of power. It's not the exercise of power. Politics ought to be defined on its own terms as a mode of acting, such as the praxis, mode of acting, put into practice by a specific kind of subject and deriving from a practical form of reason. So it's about subject. It is the political relationship that allows one to think the possibility of a political subject or sub subjectivity, le sujet politique, not the other way around. And so I take it that essentially the question here is uh, uh, the question about the subject of politics, what or who constitutes the subject of politics, and I think, and this is my thesis here, that comedy provides a very, potentially very interesting insight into it. Now, back to history. Uh, in 1808, uh, 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 August Wilhelm Schlegel delivered 30 lectures on dramatic art and literature in Vienna, so for lessons on dramatic kunst and literature. So his uh, knowledge of uh, both ancient modern literature is uh, quite impressive. His influence on literary criticism is uh, decisive, and his approach to the analysis of literary text in the history and structure is exemplary in Romanticism. And so I take it that uh, our uh, fascination with tragedy is very much rooted in its rendering and interpretation in and by the Romantic. Now, in particular, here in his attempt to understand comedy, uh, Schlegel follows three historical well-established oppositions. The first one is between comedy and tragedy, so opposition of comedy to tragedy. Uh, this uh, tradition, of course, goes back to Aristotle and continues without interruption in modernity. Schlegel takes ancient comedy to be paradigmatically represented in uh, Aristophanes' old comedy, which is, uh, uh, it takes as a complete parody of the tragic form. So uh, I quote from 
Schlegel tragedy, he says, delights in harmonious unity, comedy flourishes in chaotic exuberance. Tragedy, by painful emotions, elevates us to the most di dignified use of humanity. Comedy, on the other hand, by its jocose and depreciatory view of all things, calls forth the most petulant hilarity. Unquote. Now, the second opposition is between old and new comedy, which uh, I think is important. Uh, um, uh, the examples I'll, I'll be drawing, so called political examples, are mostly come from new comedy. So Schlegel here follows common view that new comedy, which uh, follows uh, old comedy of roughly two generations, is as he thought uh, the old tamed uh, down. Uh, the law adopted at the end of the Peloponnesian War that prohibited the depiction of real people and personal attacks signifies for Schlegel the loss of political freedom that fed old comedy and was paramount for its existence. As a result, he thinks comedy loses its punch because unlike tragedy, it is only a parody of the events that are easily recognizable and fresh in recollection. And the third opposition here, which I think is important, is between uh, Greek and Roman comedy. So Schlegel does not hesitate in his evaluation here. Uh, the influence of Roman or new comedy on, uh, its, uh, on modern comedy is very well uh, known, so essentially this is probably the only ancient uh, literary genre that still sur sur survives. For instance, uh, Woody Allen is very much uh, you know, a rendering of uh, uh, new comedy. Uh, you could also think, of, of course, about uh, Shakespeare, Moliere, uh, Georg Buchner, and uh, uh, many, many others. And so uh, for Schlegel here, um, the imputed original beauty and perfection of uh, Greek originals uh, is only a romantic reconstruction, or retranslation, as Schlegel says, which may not have much to do with the lost original, because such a reconstruction is only imaginary and follows the contemporary normative ideals of beauty and propriety. Now, Latin comedies uh, are deemed by Schlegel to lack in invention and are nothing more than pure imitations, borrowings, or recasts of their Greek counterparts, and, counterparts, and as such possess, as he says, but little of the true poetic spirit. <coughs> so it establishes these three oppositions, which are still very much uh, there, tragedy against comedy, old comedy against new comedy, and Greek against uh, Latin. Now, by contrast, all the not in opposition, uh, one might say that if tragedy is a celebration of uh, death and mortality, comedy celebrates life uh, and vitality, perhaps natality, uh, if uh, I, I, I can use Hannah Arendt's uh, term. Uh, tragedy is uh, living towards death, uh, whereas comedy, as uh, Agnes Keller, for example, puts it, is living towards life. The comic, then, is coextensive with life and represents life in its constant self-renewal in very, very different, uh, very many different forms, in contrast uh, to tragedy, which represents uh, mo mostly death as life's ultimate termination and self-exhaustion. Yet the comic uh, rendering of life refers both to body and spirit. Life's self-renewal in comedy is double and ambiguous, so that uh, from its very inception, comedy ap appeals to very low uh, bodily functions, as well as to high spiritual ones in subtle intellectual jokes, for example. Both kinds of life renewal, however, are uh, entwined in a most intimate way, so that it is not always easy to strictly separate the two. In fact, such a separation is hardly necessary. Now, if comedy renews life and overcomes death, it has to be about love, because only love reproduces life in all its uh, appearances, both vulgar and sublime. The erotic co component in comedy is uh, realized as a striving towards the love as a, an impulse that can be fully released only at the very end of comedy. Now, in, uh, if comedy, as Aristotle thinks, is an imitation of life, then comedy also reproduces life. <laughs> Yet comedy is also an art, particularly dramatic art, which means that it is also productive. Comedy artfully creates artificial situations that can be uh, uh, philosophical and political, very informative, that do not occur in life, but show life as it's sort of distilled and separated from the boredom of repetition and of the everyday inconclusiveness of action. Now, referring to and living in everydayness, comedy rejects everydayness in order to come to an end. And this end always has to be a sort of good end, good ending, or happy, you could uh, say, which is uh, Aristotle's uh, definition of comedy. So formally speaking, this is probably the most distinctive and conspicuous feature uh, that defines comedy. Everything, all action, all human uh, action out of praxis has to fit within a conclusion that gathers the characters, uh, the actors, 
uh, together and resolves the intrigue of the plot into a good ending or resolution of the conflict. Unlike tragedy, which has uh, to have a kind of bad ending, comedy must have resources to find a way out to a good ending, always uh, away from a present impasse and dead end. Uh, the originality of comedy about which I'm, uh, uh, I'm speaking here is realized both in the development of its plot and through the dialectical interaction of individual characters uh, with each other. Comedy is uh, universal and reflective in that in and through everyday situations it presents our own human condition to us, to us as spectators who are at the same time actors in the comedy of life such a situation is always concrete and unique and yet is always common. That is, uh, is the one in which we spectators can easily place ourselves and thus become actors. Our comic self-cognition is then realized as watching others act in a comedy and imagining ourselves as others and others as ourselves. Now, resolution of conflict at the end of a comedy that appears irresolvable in the very beginning requires great dramatic skill, you could also say political skill, in the construction of the plot. Similar to a valid and uh, sound argument, a good plot may be bo uh, borrowed and freely contaminated from several other uh, sources or other comedies. The rationality of comedy may also be seen in that its complex and intense plot resembles in a structure a long and sophisticated uh, um, a philosophical or maybe even legal argument that, does, that goes through the premises to complication, to conclusion, or uh, as Greeks uh, call it, catastrophe is the uh, moment of resolution. Now, comic plot is more a product of a carefully calculating and demonstrative reason rather than of a unre unrestricted productive imagination because at the end, of the action should arrive at a mutually acceptable and shareable state of affairs. The structural similarity or analogy between comic plot and uh, philosophical uh, argument, or uh, I would also say political action, is quite striking. One might even say that comedy is a dramatization of such reasoning, indeed, indeed both comic plot and logical, uh, or, uh, philosophical, even legal argument are understandable at, at any step in their development, but both are rather hard to keep and remember in their entirety due to the complexity and abundance of subtle yet important details. Now, uh, in comedy, we find not only a structural analogy between uh, plot and argument, but also a straightforward comic imitation and parody of uh, such uh, uh, legal philosophical uh, argument and uh, argumentation. Examples of such parody in, in comedy are really numerous, beginning with Aristophanes, who famously mocks his fellow contemporary sophist in the cloud, or a comic contest between Aeschylus and Euripides in the uh, frogs. Now, uh, a very important uh, constituent in, in comedy, and I think uh, this is uh, also why it uh, becomes political, very important, significant, is the uh, main character, main comic character. In uh, a new comedy, it's always invariably, uh, in, in ancient new comedy, which has had to rise uh, even nowadays, it's a clever slave, servus, ancilla, servant or maid, can be both male or female, or transgender, is one of the central figures of comedy, uh, really omnipresent in new comedy, in Menander, Plautus, Terence, Moliere, and you know, up to Woody Allen. And he or she is also the most important character, the one who rescues everyone in an apparently unsolvable situation and leads everyone out from the impasse and dead end. Thus, uh, for example, uh, a kind of palestro in pa uh, uh, Plautus Milius Gloriosus and Eugenius Cyrus in, in, in Terence are the kind of conductors and of an undisciplined orchestra of comic characters as well of the, uh, as the directors of the intrigue who stage and plan a whole new drama within the current drama. Now, traditional society requires loyalty and discretion, so fides et tatsurgentes, in a slave or a servant. In comedy, however, along with other characters, a slave receives uh, justification, and so there is a deep moment of uh, justice I implied in uh, a comedy. Not only is she recognized as equal to others, but she also becomes an embodiment of practical reason and wisdom through which she can solve apparently unsolvable problems. Yeah, so she's always in a socially lower, much lower position. So this, uh, the comic character is essentially non-white in comedy. But she uh, it turns out to be uh, really the mastermind behind the plot and the most 
uh, the, the, the smartest of all uh, characters, really the politician on stage. So not only is she recognized as equal to others, but she becomes an embodiment of practical reason and wisdom through which she can resolve solve uh, apparently unsolvable problems, which uh, she does by reasoning that results again in a practical action. In comedy, a slave is, or a, a maid a servant is no longer discreet and silent, but has a right, in fact, an obligation to speak, thereby becoming the mastermind behind the development of the comic plot. Now, as Plato argues in his laws, comedy depicts base and ridiculous things, and that's why it is suspicious for him, and therefore should be left only to slaves and foreigners, yeah. duos like senators. A slave, in fact, is a foreigner, as often the uh, very name of a comic character suggests, Cyrus, for example. And a foreigner is a comic figure because uh, she speaks, acts, and looks quite differently in stark, di stark distinction to the homogeneous moral community of the like-minded, and also like-looking. However, a foreigner or slave is never a bore exactly because she can see and tell things differently. In this sense, the uh, philosopher, and I think also practical uh, a politician is a comic figure uh, and a foreigner to her own country, as Hans Blumenberg notes in Thracian Maid, because she despises the common sense that she lacks. She is lacking and is or should be ready and capable of thinking beyond the accepted social and political divides and cultural cliches. In fact, the classless, I could say, uh, intelligence always uh, consists of a set of uh, really uh, comic characters. Already in new comedy, and especially in uh, the uh, Roman cosmopolitan and multicultural world, there is an uh, understanding of the contingency of all uh, kind of distinctions, especially class distinctions. For instance, in uh, Minander Samia, uh, one of the characters, Moschio, who is uh, also a slave, says, people do not differ by birth, and it would be only just that the honest be free and the morally based, uh, in fact, recognized as slaves. In comedy, it is the slave who is wise, and the master is either greedy and stupid or self-indulgent and inexperienced. It is the slave who helps his or her master out of a difficult situation and cheers him up by entertaining him with uh, sometimes quite uh, uh, indecent jokes. And therefore, only a slave is in comedy can transgress social differences and show that they are always only a matter of convention and have nothing to do with the human condition which is both rational and comic, insofar as it always allows for a good ending of one's life as achieved through action and deliberation with others. Now, the uh, slave plays the same role in comedy as Socrates does in uh, dramatized dialogue. The former directs, directs the plot, the latter steers the uh, argument. Both uh, the slave and Socrates appear and deliberately make themselves appear as somewhat simplistic, both come under an ironic guise behind which we quickly discover a powerful and very sophisticated mind. Therefore, both are uh, 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 practical philosophers. The slave is a practical thinker, the one who leads us through the labyrinth of a plot, and so Socrates guides us through the maze of an argument, even if often towards a uh, negative outcome. Both selflessly promote the happiness of others, well-being of others. The slave, by directing them towards a resolution of the current conflict, Socrates by steering others to the freedom of and in thought. Both free themselves by helping others. The slave is often rewarded for his or her deeds with the highest gift, that of freedom. And Socrates is free by, uh, in his knowledge uh, of his apparent not knowing. Being not limited to any fixed knowledge, he keeps striving towards finding out how and what things are. Defining things, that's I think, uh, I, I take it what we are doing here. Even socially, Socrates constantly reaches across the classes of his society. As we know from Plato and Xenophon, he prefers to talk to ordinary people, to demos, uh, without paying attention to their social position or age. Both fellow citizens and slaves become his cherished interlocutors, as a famous example with the slave boy demonstrates, where the dialectical discussion appears rather comic, insofar as Socrates guides his interlocutor from a total impasse towards a happy ending of resolving a rather complex uh, 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 geometrical uh, problem. So here I, I, would, uh, I would think that paradigmatically, at least in ancient philosophy, there are three uh, people who, uh, uh, who, uh, who e exemplify and embody this uh, figure of uh, uh, 
comic thinker. This is Aesop, who was born a slave. This is uh, Socrates, and this is Davinus the Cynic, uh, sort of my great uh, political hero. So during his uh, lifetime, in his uh, relentless critique of and subtle mockery of the sophists, Socrates keeps ridiculing a serious, often flawed argument by reproducing it and often reducing it to a farce. Even as at his deathbed, deathbed uh, he remains a comic figure who refuses to take his situation as tragic because his death is clearly a comic event for him since, as we learn from the Fido, he hopes and argues for the best as the ultimate end of his life's comedy. Now, another uh, important feature which I, uh, I'll mention here, but I, I don't have time to, to elaborate, we could do it in the qu question and answer period, is that comedy uh, exemplifies a very different structure of power, which is unlike any kind of structure of power that we uh, find in uh, modernity. And so one thus uh, might <coughs> say that the philosophy and uh, 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 philosophy, comedy, and I'll say politics are thus not identical, and yet uh, political philosophy uh, should be comic and comedy political and philosophical. Thank you. Um, Linda, I... <laughs> no, don't. <laughs> Linda, I, I just wanted to add something um, to your paper. It's fascinating. Um, that is, um, in the use of the color theory between Newton and Goethe, um, when Lichtenberg wrote to Goethe about the color white, he really stressed <laughs> the fact that when it comes to a matter of perceiving white, we, ever n we never actually see whiteness. Um, it can only ever be an abstraction, something we pull out. Um, and if we take that very seriously, I think that Goethe also saw that too as it being that sort of border, and it filters into other colors. It has the um, ramification, which is very, I can only put very strongly, is that not one of us is white. And that seems to be a very liberating kind of thought. Um, so I, I think you can just take one extra step from the color theory, um, because the first part of your talk was this abstraction of whiteness, um, or the reverse to it is that every, anyone can claim to be white, which people do constantly. It's like, who's Jewish? I mean, you know, it's a messy, messy matter. Um, and so, but I like the one that no one is white because whiteness actually can't be perceived. Oh, oh sorry. Let's, I've got uh, nine already, so let's... Oh, I'm sorry. Would you like to answer first? Oh, is it a follow-up? Thank you both for the papers. Linda, it was, um, it was an elegant analysis, and I'm not convinced at all. Um, in fact, I, I think that starting from the notion of whiteness um, as an inherent immutable disposition is actually, I mean, you made these references to, you know, the purity of blood, but there is no direct line between these things. They submerge, they come out again. There's a whole spectrum of ways in which whiteisms are conceived. And inherency is only one very, very small part of it. The immutabilities themselves, this is an argument I, I, I've made for literally almost two decades is that there is a conceived immutability, but it's protean. It's, it's movable. There's an inherent essentialism that goes, I think, that goes into, into whiteness. But it's not always the same essentialism that's at issue. It's constantly changing. It's historically um, tied. It's historically linked. Um, this, this 
this is an imaginary that you're talking about. It's, it's, it's not the difference between prescription and practice. It's actually that the epistemic politics of white, white isms are constantly being rethought and renegotiated over time. I think that's the thing that I've learned the most. That the that the the the, the ground the grounded and that I, I'm uncomfortable, I agree with you totally on the science thing. I mean Appy is like way off on this. But it doesn't need science at all. The ways in which in which being white and homo europeus and and white together again and again. It, it's very problematic even in terms, I know you're talking only in terms of the US in some way, you're trying to really ground it in American exceptionalism. But if we look at all, is so many of the colonial contexts that from which America was an exception because it didn't have colonies, mixedness was constantly there in different forms. It wasn't just this kind of of line from any kind of purity of blood. It was over and over again contested. Who is white? Japanese were white sometimes. They weren't at others. I, it, it doesn't fit for me what I actually know about these imperial forms. It fits a certain limited imaginary, but not actually the kind of epistemological space that was that was that was maneuvered, carved out over so many decades and so many. So I would just you, you only were able to give such a very short accounting here. But I, I, one more thing, I I, I I agree totally with Lydia. It's the constant fear of losing this whiteness is always there because there is no such thing as white. No one's white. Um, and that is something that, that it took me a, a really long time to get to in understanding in terms of colonialism, that it wasn't that they were scared of the mixed bloods, they were scared that there was no white there, there was no there there. <coughs> um, and in some ways it it's, it's misses to what Orientalism is like whiteism, it's a configuration of power of which the, it, certain institutions, it's a, it's a whole set. So I'd like to hear you specify more where you think this, this, white, this white exceptionalism and this American exceptional are actually located and for whom? Because I don't, I don't know who it is. Well, except for the last part, um, I, I am in agreement with you because I, like you, have a kind of Foucauldian view of meaning and the transfer. Do you want to help? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, anyway, I mean, I'm not saying, I don't think we can say there is a meaning of whiteness. I think it right. is local. Right. Silvio Torres Sayan says blackness is local and I think whiteness <coughs> is local. And right. so we have to, but I think there is a, there is a, a planetary notion of whiteness that US whiteness participates in and resonates with. So I think Foucault's useful in terms of thinking about how there can be um, influence across domains of discourse, even when there's not a logical um, implication. There's still a kind of uh, analogic co reasoning coherence. Something. Yes, analogic reasoning and coherence. And so um, that's what I'm arguing, and I'm picking up on this one strain of it, which I do think is central in the United States. It's central to uh, the way in which whiteness operates here in a way that's implicit in the political discourse, and why so many people were surprised at the responses to Obama, and still the responses to Obama. I'm not a, a um, a fan of President Obama's policies, but I've been very interested in the discourse around um, the reactions to him and the, and the representations of him vis-a-vis -vis other people, even of Netanyahu, you know, the other day. So it's, uh, the, the claim about Sangre de Puro is a claim that the, the first emergence of, of an idea, of a concept that <coughs> can then become and develop into our uh, more familiar notion of race 
uh, dominant notion of, of biological immutable characteristics idea of race, that that's the first emergence of it. It is not fully formed there. It is not, it is not logically. R right, and I'm among those who accept that position. In philosophy, it is a very contested view because most philosophers want to think Kant invented the concept of race and want to take biology as a critical yeah. constituent of the concept of race. And I, and I think if, yeah. if you have a different account of meaning um, that, that is Foucauldian, you can sort of see yeah. other... Foucault, I I, well, I am. I am. But you can, you can bring in these other elements. So I'm, I don't want to... I don't want to privilege um, a certain line for logical reasons, but I do think it's historically privileged because what I want to say is that we need, when we talk about whiteness, often we're talking past each other because there's at least three different things we can be talking about. One is the empirical, in which you can measure its wages and its benefits um, and its real estate value. <laughs> Um, and its history uh, materially, so you can measure the empirical aspects of whiteness. We can also be talking about it and as an imaginary, the ideational content of whiteness, which is primarily what I was doing here. Um, and that's going to be varied, and it's not going to be coherent, and it's not going to be consistent, and it's going to be historically changing, and it's going to be local. And we can also be talking about whiteness in terms, though, of subject formation. And that's why I, I actually dis want to disagree with the claim that nobody's white. People are white. <laughs> it, who is white can vary, and it changes, and it can change. To, you know, you, your whiteness can change as you move to a different context. So you can be whiteness in one local, local context and not in another. But what it means, I think, is, is, is again, there's a wealth of empirical evidence that's been coming out since the 90s showing different ways of interacting with each other, different ways of body language, different assumptions. Um, uh, you know, a whole variety of, of social psychological armature that's now been studied um, and shown that there is a way of being in the world. And it's not, you know, true of every person who's designated white, obviously. And, and some, some of those elements one can find in people who are not designated white. But there is still a concomitance of the elements such as um, uh, uh, anxiety around race issues that manifests in common kinds of ways. And I can talk about some concrete examples, but I don't want to take up too much time. But Claude Steele's work, Jennifer Richardson's work, so many other people's work shows this. So I want to argue it's not the case that nobody's white. There are lots of people who are white. I also want, but you know, it, this is a historical formation in Omi and Wynetson. I also want to argue that it's not the case that anybody can be white. And that's going against Bonilla Silva and certain um, popular views today that whiteness has expanded so much and that what's going to happen in the United States is it's going to expand so much to become multiracial so that he thinks already it's the case that um, Latinos are white, uh, Arabs are white, Jews are white. Um, and I don't think that that's a supportable claim. Some subsets of those groups can pass and can be interpolated throughout their lifetime in such a way that they have the subject formation and they have the empirical payoff. But most of Latinos cannot. And certainly the treatment of Arabs in Brooklyn, New York, doesn't testify to their being white. So I think that um, there's a, uh, you know, th there, there's a uh, mistaken, I think, um, view that because the ideational claims about whiteness are so false, which almost all of them are, that it doesn't have sociological reality. So people don't want to be realists about the reference, referentiality of whiteness. And I think that's a mistake. The ideational, we talk about the imaginary, there's a lot of crazy ideas there. <laughs> but there's also this referent, and I'll just end on this, because that has to do with historical experience. All of us are formed by historical experiences that impacted the economic opportunities that our families had and their interpolation by the state.
and so many other policies and where they lived and where they could be educated and so forth. And it is that organic formation that produces group differences and group behaviors and different affective uh, reactions to the Civil War or to the latest bombing um, that this government is doing. Different empathic attunements with different constituencies in the world and different um, different reactions that are, some of which are group related. So groups, on my view, are socially constructed and real. They can be charted, they're changeable. Whiteness is definitely we real. Its boundaries are always in contestation and you can chart it legally, you can also chart it empirically to see who might be included. Um, but it's also the case that whites will remain with us for some generations, given the economic disparities, the uh, lax inheritance laws, the huge disparities of real estate value and experiences, white identity is not gonna go away, at least for two or three generations, in my view. Um, I'm, I'm going to permit myself to make an intervention on the, um, on the purely philological grounds that sangre de puro means the, the blood of a cigar. I think you must mean pureza de sangre or sangre pura. I'm uh, probably mispronouncing it. I think so. Adi. For, for several minutes when you spoke, I thought that you were speaking about uh, Zionist Israel. Uh, it was so similar. Uh, and yet, we, we rarely use the term white. Uh, if we use it, it's uh, to distinguish between white Jews and black Jews. Uh, which, and black is not really black, it's the Jews from our world, etc. So it's, it's, non, it's a non-issue. And my question is about this relationship between whiteness and, and, and uh, exceptionalism. Because the imaginary of the exceptional group today can be ex expressed by a black president. Uh, it can be expressed by a Latino mayor or, or something like this. Uh, and at the same time, the, in principle at least, if not uh, and, and uh, uh, at the same time, uh, there, is, there is a clear distinction, I think, between the discourse of whiteness, of whiteness that is local, as you emphasized, and, 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 and whiteness that is uh, global, that is the Europeans uh, in Australia or something like this. Uh, it, it's not the same thing. It seems to me that what drives the, uh, what drives the problem the, the, the moral and the political problem, what creates the tension, uh, what, 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 what does the, the grouping, what is involved in the, in the construction of the group, is always a, a certain combination of, of this whiteness, which is completely accidental, and exceptionalism, which is structural, I would say. Structural, it, it, there is, there is a, something to the structure of discourse that is about the exceptional group that finds accidentally a certain, uh, a, a certain uh, uh, secondary uh, qualities, I would say, to use the old English, uh, and is implanted in, in this secondary quality. But, but without exceptionalism, whiteness would be nothing. Can I quickly, or do you want to take more? Quickly, but yes. Uh, uh, actually, let, let's take a couple more questions. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, Maxim and Andrea are so good in groups of three. Maxim. Oh, I don't have a. I don't have a question. I just wanted to. Um, to uh, there, there was something bothering. I was trying to remember when you were talking about the, the the debate between um, uh, Newton and and Goethe, and, and I couldn't remember what it was, and I just remember just now, which is that a passage from um, Notes of a Native Son, when our hero protagonist gets his first job outside in the real world, and it's in a white paint factory. <laughs> um, and he's being 
he's being instructed on how white paint is made, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a dirty, dangerous, low-pay job. And the foreman says, in all seriousness, you have to put a, a drop of black paint mm -hmm. in every batch. And he says, well, why is that? And, the, and he says, well, it doesn't look white in the right way otherwise. And when I first read that passage yeah. back in my young and sensitive days, I thought, I mean, this, I'm going to try to connect the two papers. The, I thought, that's tragedy. Now I was, it's obvious that Baldwin was, was being funny. And I think... An invisible man, thank you very much for that. It's an invisible man, yeah. And now I think it's, the, uh, now I think he's, he was obviously being funny. Um, um, so I don't have a question, uh, actually. I just wanted to show off that I remembered <laughs> that, 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 that particular passage uh, and, and see whether you remember. Uh, that it's a kind of uh, uh, plebeian uh, democratic um, uh, uh, practice, where I, I strongly disagree uh, with uh, the uh, parallel with, uh, with Socrates. Socrates is not a comic figure. Um, he's rather the, the figure of the, of, of the master who knows, uh, although he claims that he does not know, but at least he does not know what all the... He knows that he does not know why all the others don't know that. And in fact, uh, as um, Kasuriadis have argued, um, he's a very tragic figure, and, th and thus his death, uh, because he has committed hubris. He wants to be above the city, he wants to be this fly that, uh, we know all these metaphors that are elitistic. So I, I don't know, what do you gain by uh, contaminating this wonderful argument uh, with this unpleasant figure of Socrates? <laughs> Thanks, Andres. Uh, well, in fact, for those who don't know, this is a continuation of the discussion that is going on between Andres and uh, me for a couple of years, uh, at least. Now, um, uh, let me just briefly stress uh, why I think comedy is uh, uh, so important, because comedy is, is a genre. Yeah, it's an ancient genre, so why should we bother? There are different genres. I take it that uh, uh, every genre is a system of uh, a convention, sometimes explicit, sometimes imp implicit, that codes certain forms of action, of praxis. Yeah. And comedy in particular, that was my argument, is important because it, uh, it, it uh, sort of comes uh, with, with uh, it codifies certain way of action which I think is particularly important in order to understand uh, um, various modes of uh, democratic uh, uh, political practice. Now, what is uh, particularly important? First of all, as uh, I said, I think uh, here uh, um, uh, Andres and uh, we agree with Andres that uh, uh, it's about the demos. Yeah? It's about the plurality. It's many people. That's the definition of uh, d democracy. It's also about the dispossessed, the poor. Yeah? So comedy is uh, the genre of the, where the protagonist uh, is not just well, sometimes one protagonist, sometimes more. The protagonists are the wretched of the earth. So this is their uh, uh, way to, uh, to, to, to justice. Yeah. Um, and, and the comic justice comes <coughs> with the reinstating of those who are in a uh, socially and politically and economically lower position, the dispossessed, and this allows them to gain freedom for others, by the way, and also for uh, themselves. So there is, there is a comic justice that makes these people who are uh, oppressed the uh, kind of the winners really uh, liberates them. Now, as I said, it doesn't come uh, about I mean, naturally as a stroke of fate. Yeah, there's nothing. Uh, there's not no no fate there. It comes about as a very careful reasoning through the entire comedy and the plot is very, very complex, very rational. In one of the comedies in Molière, Les Femmes Savantes, uh, I calculated, well, according to my reduction, exactly 26 steps in which you should follow the plot in order to uh, reach the resolution and the good ending. You cannot confine any of them. So it's very uh, rational. There's a lot of thinking, calculation. And this thinking is done on stage with others, not in isolation, by this dispossessed uh, uh, together, so interaction with uh, others. And so here I take it that uh, 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 philosopher, in a sense, is a comic, a comic, not the comic, a comic figure, 
And as I said, uh, for me, in antiquity at least, this uh, uh, is represented by three, by, by three uh, people, uh, Aesop, yeah. that means uh, the cynic, uh, but also Socrates. Now here I think our ways part with Andreas, because I do not uh, find Socrates uh, as a mastermind of some uh, plot that is meant to subjugate others by means of use or abuse the power of knowledge, which he masks and, uh, as not knowledge, or pretends as not uh, knowing uh, at all. Now, for, uh, again, what for me constitutes the, the uh, figure of a, a comic character. And so as I said, for me, a comic character is essentially non-white. Uh, it's uh, somebody who is, uh, really fights the uh, oppression, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, of, 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 of uh, uh, oppression, and this is somebody who is capable of uh, producing this careful thinking on stage. One, and two, somebody who uh, is always in social lower position, uh, position. So this is the poor, a poor, an oppressed. Uh, and I, I take it that uh, Socrates in, in, in some way embodies all this, because as I said, he hangs around, he talks uh, to the poor, to the demons, to the dispossessed. Maybe it's uh, just a uh, ironic uh, pretense, but I think uh, so here we really differ with, uh, with, with Andreas. Thanks. So to Adi, I want to say that um, yes, a, a black president or a Latino mayor can provide a kind of alibi that we are exceptional, that we have this polyglot nation where there's class mobility, but I don't think that actual um, voter suffrage of non-white peoples in the United States would do that. I think that that's a conflict. So it, we can allow Obama to be you know, the president, but we can't really allow African Americans to vote in the numbers that they should be able to vote in. If, they, if, if, pres, you know, if, if people who had felonies could vote and everybody, everybody could vote. Because that is in conflict. It, because the notion of the American exceptionalism is not simply about um, class mobility and being polyglot. It is about um, being capable of establishing a polity that is the leader of the world. So that's why I was, what I was drawing from Krebaker and Jefferson, which is a historical argument. I don't think whiteness is simply an em empty signifier that's just sort of arbitrarily attached to play this role. It is, it's a particular constellation of peoples who were here that could be invoked and needed to be invoked because it's true that whiteness is the alibi for plutocracy, right? It, it is the, it's, it's the invocation of a group that then can serve as a majority um, so that the government, if it's white dominated can be claimed to be a representative government even though it's not a representative government by class or other measures. So it's, I, I think the fact that a particular constituency coming from Europe was designated in this way is, is a historical sociological formation that occurred for these reasons. Um, and it, it, it's, not, it's not actually, white exceptionalism is not actually compatible then with uh, full franchise for non-whites in, in the United States, which is why it has to be suppressed. Um, I think, you know, the, the pain example, I remember that example too, and I think it, it, um, it's useful because what Ellison is pointing to, and Baldwin also pointed to, and Elaine Locke and others, is that the content of whiteness, even the ideational content of whiteness, is in part of a product to which non-whites have contributed. Um, Elaine Locke goes so far as to say that what we think of as Southern white identity involving a certain hospitality, and informality, I mean, think Paula Deen, right? Southern, the paradigm of Southern white cultural identity um, was produced, at, uh, Locke said in, in the 20s, by a leaving of 
of humor and nonchalance from a peasant matrix that was not given any credit for that, right? So they were influenced, in other words, by African peoples that they lived so closely amongst. And that's what Southern white identity is. That's part of what makes it what it is, and it's true of other um, varying formations of whiteness. So it's not that, whiteness is not pure. That's part of just the lie of the ideational part, empirically, sociologically, psychologically, it has never been pure. But it cannot acknowledge that without, um, uh, you know, cost to its vanguard status. Gene, uh, Jason, and you. I'm a little confused about um, what's actually being argued here uh, because, uh, because um, I, I, if this is an analysis of whiteness at the local in the United States, um, that's one thing. But um, I was intrigued, if, it, if it's more than this, then um, it certainly doesn't start with the United States. I mean, there were other <laughs> empire, white empire, imperialist Britons. But um, I was, I'm intrigued by, and by, the, by your, um, by the importance of severing um, uh, uh, race from biology. So it's not the 19th century phenomenon. And I was thinking, I mean, the problem is that if one does that, and, you, and, and given your definition, purity, um, inherited, all of that stuff, I was just trying to think conceptually, how would one distinguish that between, let's say, the understandings of a society of orders? or a caste society, which is not about race, but they're certainly inherited blood and all that. That's one, that's one question. The other question, just as a sort of exper thought experiment, I mean, there have been and are um, empires that uh, are not about whiteness. For example, China. So um, how would that fit in in this kind of a story? In other words, the Chinese certainly, or, or Japan, in, in another context, certainly thought of themselves uh, in, I suspect, in, and I think, I don't know, in your kind of racial terms, I think, but it certainly wasn't whiteness, but it was a hell of a lot of privilege and power, et cetera. So what do we do with that? Okay. Um, yeah, my question is for Linda, too, and I think it, it really is getting at Audie's question from a slightly different perspective and maybe pushing you on a, on a similar point. And it's about this kind of con connection, entailment between American exceptionalism and white exceptionalism. So it's like when you give the definition of American exceptionalism, Linda, you give a, a kind of a, a, a substantial content-filled definition. And the way that I understand it, you know, pr primarily from somebody like Sakwan Berkovich, you know, is that it's a formal structure. American it can be reduced to a kind of formula, you know, singular history, universal significance. And then you can go and see how that is filled with historical content you have, you know, from Winthrop's City on a Hill, Community of Righteousness, Sullivan's Manifest Destiny, Cold War, Citadel of Liberty, whatever. But at any time, it, it sustains that similar structure. That's a part of its, its hold. Um, so with that in mind, it seems that the connection between American exceptionalism and white exceptionalism that you identify as having a historical reality could be easily reversed. In other words, it's very easy to conceive, not just with the Obama example, but it's very easy to, to conceive how uh, a definition of a robust, tolerant, American pluralistic society comes to become definitional, definitional to a particular conception of exceptionalism, where you still have exceptionalism working in all of the same nefarious ways geopolitically, but not based on this uh, racialized identity. So I, I think this is a version of Audie's question, but I, I, I just wasn't fully satisfied with the answer, and I guess I just want to add this idea of American exceptionalism as a kind of formal uh, problem, not something that is filled with a particular historical content. I'm sorry, I have seen you, but there's a gentleman over here and then it's Okay, thank you. And my question is for Dimitri. Thank you for your paper, both of you. I absolutely agree with you that tragedy has been heightened and hypothesized due to romantic German romanticism and idealism, and possibly because they already see tragedy as if it were philosophy already. 
so it's easier to interpret in terms of a of a kind of idealist philosophy, subjectivity, everything that that entails. At the same time, I was struck by the fact that your reading of comedy is really through literary drama, whereas I tend to think the revalidation of comedy, particularly in mod from modernism onwards, has to do with the way that the comic is kind of revisioned and rehabilitated through the oral, through the popular, through the mysteries, through the passion of Christ as a, as a comedy, not a tragedy. Um, and I do think we have, we begin to have kind of very sophisticated theories of comedy with Bergson's essay on laughter, with Bakhtin's idea of, of the carnivalesque, through, a, through again, through a kind of um, revival of the Comedia dell'arte, the, the Balagan, the, the puppets, all the discussions on puppets in modernism, um, the variety theater, the, the position of, of the circus in all the manifestos of the historical avant-garde. So there is that other tradition, Benjamin calls it the mule, the, the smuggler's path in theater history, that I think has a lot to do with, with comedy. So I was, I was particularly interested in the fact that you were, your philosophical reading of, of comedy still relies on a model that is heavily literary. We have two more questions. I'm going to collect those as well and ask you to uh, answer. I, I came here for whiteness, so, um, but I'll, I'll start with a, a comedian, but George Carlin used to say that, George Carlin used to say if you get young white people and young black people together, the black language will predominate. And I'm also, uh, I'm reminded that when Elvis Presley died, David Brinkley referred to him as white trash, which produced this huge reaction among people. Um, and then I'll, I'll give you another cultural artifact. I'm re right now reading a book called Jefferson's Sons. So um, it's a young adult book. I've been reading a lot on Jefferson and slavery. And I love the Faulkner quote. I thought the Faulkner, and I, both, I like both quotes quite a bit. But um, since Jefferson came up with the, I think he developed the word octoroon, um, which then Faulkner uses. It's, it's really nice. But um, in the American context, this idea that American exceptionalism had some sort of implicit white exceptionalism and to begin with it. You know, I think you have to take into account different regions and sections. Because the idea that there, there is an idea of American exceptionalism in that you know, there is a supposedly unoccupied, unoccupied by people of the same level as Europeans that will give the chance to create a new future. And so there's a, I think there's a, I mean, I usually refer in terms of mastery in different regions, whether it's mastery over Native Americans, whether it's mastery over slaves, whether it's mastery over wilderness. Um, and then the, this idea of white exceptionalism that's coming up now seems to me, I mean, um, I mean but the, one of the things that's always struck me is that, um, you know, our first black president is not descended from slaves. You know, which is, it, it, it's a point that's not brought up a lot. Um, and, but the, the, um, it seems to be both a denial of guilt and a denial of this new idea of a you know, multiracial society. The a claim of privilege, a denial of guilt, and a denial of uh, the idea that the American exceptionalism can incorporate, incorporate a multiracial society. So I'm, I would think that somehow looking at the development of the two ideas in tandem, because I think the idea of white exceptionalism comes out, in, you know, it's, an oppositional, it's an oppositional category. Um, so, you know, that's, I'll leave it there, but um, that was my comment. Thank you. Uh, Nadia. Dimitri, uh, yes, I like very much your presentation, but I don't know why you don't insist more on the Romans, because it is in the Roman popular culture that you find that you find comedy uh, only. They don't have tragedy. Uh, Seneca is the first one to write a tragedy when the Republic is over and when... So they have only comedy. They have only ordinary life. Uh, only, uh, not necessarily the rascals. 
but simply ordinary human beings. Uh, they have no, it is as if the aristocracy of the Tog doesn't have any kind of uh, uh, genre of its own. They don't have a tragedy. They are a great fighter, they are great orators. They don't have intellectuals, they don't have Socrates, and you don't have intellectual, you don't have tragedy somehow. So in my view, you should really move toward a more popular uh, kind of, uh, um, um, without calling democratic, I don't know, this is, is another story, but popular in the ordinary sense of uh, um, non-heroic, uh, non-extraordinary life uh, that uh, represents itself on the, on the scene, on the stage, and uh, gives uh, an image of itself through the stage. Otherwise, they don't have it, because it's a large population without without any point of reference through which they can, they, can, they can represent themselves. So that is an important topic. Instead of Socrates, not because I, Socrates is crucial, but in this case, seems to be out of the point. I'm going to ask our two speakers to answer in one minute and 57 seconds each. Well, to, to Jean, I don't think there are absolute distinctions between race, ethnicity, caste. Um, we can make certain local distinctions. Weber talks about the connections between ethnicity and race and how they can merge into one another and, and one is created out of the other, in fact. And there's a, a, a long tradition of thinking about this. I think it's only sort of been the recent, it's, and it's been influenced by the scientific stuff that have wanted some necessary and sufficient conditions for race separate from all these other categories. But if we have a, you know, a different account of how meaning operates, I think we're going to see a, a, a merger. I mean, I think race involves visible difference that is attributed immutable characteristics and then set into a hierarchy. Um, you could also apply that to, to caste. It merges into ethnic hierarchies, but, but I don't think there's absolute distinctions. And the, the Chinese, there's some very interesting work on comparative imperialisms that some people are doing in the subcontinent, what used to be called the subcontinent, and in China, to look at contrasting notions of ethnic um, hierarchies that worked in some ways similar, in some ways quite differently, but yes, there, it's an it's a equal opportunity uh, problem across the world that takes different forms. I think, I think we need to specify the forms rather than trying to reduce all of this. Some people today are trying to reduce all of these different forms into a xenophobia and then um, say that anti-ethnic hatreds and racism and all are, are all, and I think that that doesn't give you enough explanatory value. I think we need to actually ta uh, begin to diversify our understandings of what race is, how it operates, and what racism is. Um, the, I, I want to thank people for the, for the questions and the comments, because these are very helpful for me in helping me th think beyond it. I think this, the, the issue of America, I just want to respond to the issue of the relationship between American ex exceptionalism and white exceptionalism. On the one hand, um, I would concede the point that it might be possible to separate the two. Um, but on the other hand, uh, I'm not arguing on the basis of a certain logical consistency through the history. So what do we get from Jefferson? We get the idea that Europeans have a motivation to shed their old skins and creve coeur, right? They have a motivation to shed their old skins and to, and to create an identity anew. That's what... He, that's why African slaves, uh, so you have the issue of grievances and you also have the, is the issue of a different relationship to the polity of the U.S. state and a different trajectory of immigration that gives people a different felt connection to prior identities, right? And different historical connections to prior identities. And so I want to say there is a concordance between that idea and Jefferson and Crever Kerr and um, certain anti-racist versions of white exceptionalism I think we'd, and we'd the critique of identity politics. I'll just finish on this yeah. sentence that, that people of color cannot be included in the polity and are constantly a problem in the polity because they're not shedding their prior identities. And I think it also <coughs> explains the desire to shed whiteness as well. <laughs> 